Hello, and welcome to Save Your Sanity Podcast. This is Dr. Roberta Shaler. If you have a hijackal in your life, whether that's your parent, your partner, a coworker, a friend, somebody in authority in a church or an organization, you will know that because you just don't want to be around them. And again, no matter what the system that you're finding this person in, you need to know certain things that they do, but you need to know what to do in response to them. And so you can learn a lot at forrelationshiphelp.com where you'll find a lot of things I have there for you or go to my YouTube channel, which is also for relationship help. So youtube.com slash for relationship help. Today, I want to talk about three things that are really important, three empowering responses to the backstabbers, the rhinos, and the hijackals at work. Now, you may know that I've written a book called Wrestling Rhinos, Conquering Conflict in the Wilds of Work. So that's where the rhinos come from, those difficult people at work. And they may or may not be hijackals, which is my term for the difficult, toxic people and often disturbing people that you have in your life. So today I want to offer you three truly empowering responses. When you really get these into your system and work it, you're going to feel powerful and confident. So three empowering responses to backstabbers, rhinos, and hijackals. And I'm going to talk about them in the workplace, but of course, no matter where they are, the responses still work. So whatever are people thinking when they're being two-faced? Well, first of all, they're probably not thinking too much. They're only thinking about themselves. But are they really thinking that people are stupid and they can't see the forest for the trees? Well, if they happen to be a hijackal, they think they're the smartest person in every room. So that would be the case. So at work, when meetings take place surreptitiously, like behind closed doors or snapped blinds, then suspicion builds. And I was working with a finance department for a major agency, and the director was well-known and feared for her supposed open-door policy. It sounded good to me in the beginning, but loudly she proclaimed that anyone at any time was welcome to come and speak with her in her office. Sounded good. She declared that she wanted open communication and everyone feeling able to talk to her. Sounds even better. So what was the problem? Well, when a brave person would muster up his or her courage and take her at her word, it was likely that in moments, the yelling voice of the director could be heard throughout the department, complete with language suitable for the gutter. Oh, but that wasn't all. Seconds later, the door of her office would slam shut and the blinds would snap and that hopeful employee trapped inside, and the abuse would continue. So when I was brought in to act as a consultant and a trainer and a coach for this team, my task was to turn them into a functioning team of nine people. So what did I have? One screamer, three middle managers living on tenterhooks all the time, and five subordinates afraid to speak or step sideways. Whoa! You can believe that there were many days that these folks seriously considered sick leave. So what do we know? People enjoy power. Some people abuse power. And they do it from fear. No one needs to abuse power when they feel secure. When they know they're competent and capable, then they have nothing to prove. But then some people feel they have to stomp on or mess with folks in order to get a promotion. And in some dysfunctional businesses, sadly, this is true. I was recently working with an executive coaching client who had a boss who wanted harmony at any price. He was petrified of managing conflict in his office. My client was bringing in great clients with their money, but her subordinates didn't like her at all. So the boss, in his wisdom, decided to release my client rather than deal with the underhanded and in-her-face behavior of the subordinate, all in the name of peace. So strange things happen in the business world sometimes. Now, of course, the opposite also could happen. 
The person who brings in the most money could be allowed to trample over the subordinates because the bottom line is more important than respect. Now, that's sad, too. You know, not long ago, a reader wrote to me about a director who played power games, and this woman called meetings at inconvenient times and then invited her favorites along. And this setting of meetings at inconvenient times required folks to shift their priorities, maybe upset their family plans, and even give up weekends just to satisfy this woman's whims. But she took the abuse of power to a whole new level. Once everyone had changed their plans to accommodate her, what did she do? She changed her mind. She changed the meeting time. And then everyone was expected to shift again. And all I was thinking was, what an incredibly insecure woman. So backstabbing, gossiping, greed, power games, these are all a sign of an unhealthy organization. And worse, those who engage in these things are wasting vital energy and making themselves miserable. And you might think that eliminating things will change the promotions and that these things will eliminate you from the promotion ranks. And you might think that I don't understand how the game is played around here. Believe me, I do. My question to you is, are you willing to give up your integrity and your peace of mind on a daily basis in order to play into someone else's misguided power games? Are you? What is the real prize there? Yes, I know you need the paycheck. That's not what I'm talking about. We all do need to be able to earn our keep. But how about this? How about you behave in integrity with your values and refuse to play? Wouldn't that feel better? You're wondering how to do it. I'm going to tell you. But wouldn't you enjoy each day more? And then eventually people would get the message about you. So that's why I want to offer you three empowering responses to work with backstabbers, rhinos, and hijackles. So here we go. The first one, and they're going to sound counterintuitive, so just hear me out. The first one is be the appreciator. Catch people doing things right. Mention things you appreciate, no matter how small. Comment on the things you like. Discuss what you prefer. Always have that running ahead of you. You know, William James, the father of psychology, said, the deepest craving of the human nature is the need to be appreciated. Now, good news. Appreciation is cost free. It doesn't cost you a thing to appreciate someone. Yeah, you may have to grit your teeth for a moment, but do it. Move the things you like forward by talking about the things you like. Because if we get into that downward pattern, that downward spiral of talking about ain't it awful and he done me wrong and this place is terrible, you're not going to move anything forward. You're just going to get more and more mired in the muck. So move the things you like forward by talking about them. Even in your primary relationship, catch each other doing things right and comment on it. You know, I had a music teacher once. I was trained to be a, a concert pianist and she was really tough. And she would hit my hands and she would yell and scream and things. But she taught me one really important lesson. I happened to have a gift for sight reading, which meant that I could have a piece of music put in front of me, and I still can, of course, and I can just read it and play it. So there were contests for that kind of thing. And of course, I usually won. So she would train me to do this. The one thing that I get from that woman who was miserable and unhappy, but very talented, was she said to me, when you're sight reading a piece, and when you go into a contest, you get one minute to look at the piece, and then you have to play it. So she said, while you're sitting there, remind yourself that you are going to play the piece as beautifully as possible and let the bad notes fall on the floor. So you're going to move the things you like forward 
and not comment on the others. You can do something about them, but you don't need to be talking about it all the time. So I would play the piece of music, making it as beautiful as possible. And if I hit any wrong notes, I let them fall on the floor. You can do that too. Because appreciation is cost free. Really it is. And you move those things forward, those positive things, the things you like, the things you want to see more of, you move them forward by talking about them. And it takes almost no effort to find something you appreciate about every person you know. Just make sure it's genuine. Give voice to it. And guess what? People will see you differently. People will expect different things from you. People will come at you with a different frame of mind. So first empowering tip, be the appreciator. In number two, big one in your life. Big, big, big. I wish everybody would take this to heart. It makes all the difference. I know when I figured it out, it did. Number two, never say anything you don't want to be true, especially when you speak about yourself. Now, This one could change the face of the planet, let alone the culture of the workplace or your primary relationship. Speak only about what you want to see happen. What would improve things? Focus on the positive and give voice to it. Now, I'm not being Pollyanna here. I know we need to solve conflicts. I know that we need to have communication skills. I know we need to know how to negotiate. I'm talking as a general rule, as a general way outlook of bringing to whatever relationship you're in. Just focus on the positive and comment on that. So it's not Pollyanna thinking, you know, I wrote a book called What You Pay Attention to Expands. And I wrote that book because it's true. What You Pay Attention to Expands and it's available on Amazon. So how much energy do you lose when you engage in the poor me and the ain't it awful conversations? A whole lot. And you're doing it to yourself. I'll bet you would not list gossip, backstabbing, or negativity as one of the desirable values you hold dear, but yet you may be behaving as though you do. You may be behaving as though that's true. So remember, your behavior demonstrates your belief, and there's no way around that one. So that's number two. Never say anything you don't want to be true, especially when you talk to yourself in your head. And the number three empowering strategy is be proactive. The first rule of change is be the change you want to see in the world. That's what Gandhi said, and I believe it's paramount. How many people expect behaviors from others that they're not willing to demonstrate themselves? Talk about what you want to create. Keep the buzz going about what's possible. Influence the culture of your workplace just by being you with your very presence. Be strong. Be the voice for fair play and reason. And then would that person who calls those meetings that inconvenience everybody be happy if it happened to her? No, she'd be the first person to complain and yell and scream unfair. And would the person who runs to you with the latest gossip be thrilled to be the topic of conversation tomorrow morning? No, he'd be outraged and declare it was unfair and everybody was being mean. And would that backstabber cry when stabbed? Louder than anyone. So what can we do to have these three empowering responses to these backstabbers, rhinos, and hijackals? Just stop the nonsense. Do your part. Stop the nonsense. Don't play. Refuse to play. It will soon end the game, at least the game around you. And that's what's important. No, I'm not talking about being a wuss or a doormat or a snob. That's not being in integrity with what you value. It's not in integrity with being the person you most want to be. I'm suggesting you use your energy and your time and resources in ways that make you feel good every day. After all, you're creating your quality of life. Yeah, there are risks. You may be happier. People may gravitate toward you and want to play on your team. You may become a leader and have the opportunity to demonstrate a better way of doing things. And of course, there are other risks. You might be seen as different or no fun at all. 
Some people don't like people to rain on pity parties. Or you may catch the eye of the offender in power. And guess what? You'll be the one who is promulgating positivity. You be the one showing that there is another, a better way to make it through the workday. And they just may want you on their team. Why? Because you're easy to be around, you're focused on the positive, and you're getting things done. So, okay, <laughs> these things may be well, a little radical thought to you, but do the math. You're easy to be around while sharing what's possible for the team or the relationship or the department or the company. That has to be attractive. So hang in. Backstabbers lose every day. People see them for who they are. Not only will you be winning every day personally, you very well may win the day because you've decided you are going to be a shift shaper. Shift, S-H-I-F-T, shaper. You are going to say, no, here's the environment I want to live in and I'm going to create it around me. That's one of the ways that you can save your sanity at work or in any relationship. And yes, sometimes you have to walk away. No question. But I wanted to give you some positive things that you could do in the face of these difficult people, no matter where they are in your life. And I hope that's helpful to you. I look forward to talking with you soon. And thanks for listening to Save Your Sanity podcast. Visit forrelationshiphelp.com and let's see what we can improve together. Talk soon. <laughs>